class. I'm still like putting the images in the background and stuff like okay. that. Okay. Just... All right. Do you have any specific questions or is this something that would be better off looking at in lab? Okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, um, let's look at it in lab and I might be able to help you out if you're running into difficulty with that. If you have not already, spend some time looking at the project because over the next few classes we're going to talk about creating a website and that gets into our semester project. And don't think that you have an extremely long time to go, right? Because we're in week five now out of 15. So we're a third of the way done with the class. Um, so things creep up on you pretty quickly um, in a semester. So let's look at what you're required to do for this. So you can begin thinking about it now. We'll take a minute to look about what the requirements are for this and for the portfolio. And I'll do my best to answer any questions that you might have concerning it. Let's start talking about the portfolio first because that's the one that your first draft of it is due sooner than the first part of the project. Portfolio. Portfolios exist for uh, a number of reasons. They can be used within an educational context to help show me and show yourself exactly what you've learned throughout a semester. Uh, I think it's good to look back at your earlier assignments, see what you did, see what you could do differently um, with what you know now. Probably every assignment that you've turned in, you probably could do a better version of it now than you could when you turned it in, simply because you've learned more stuff since then. Uh, portfolios are also very useful in, in this career field because it's a way for you to demonstrate um, to potential employers or potential clients your capabilities. So let's Google a web developer portfolio. Let's see if we can find an example or two. All right, let's find one of these. I don't know why I'm scrolling across these. Let's just pick one. All right. In this case, person has examples of stuff that they've done in different fields. They must have worked on this website. The BBC iPlayer. And we can visit the website. It's a little bit about the project, a little bit of what, what technology they used on the project, and in this case, a thing to download. Now you can augment your portfolio with a number of things. For example, you could include a blog where you gave JavaScript tips, like this person did that.
latest JavaScript tip. And you can go to it and this talks about the usage of a particular technique in JavaScript. How this is the fastest way to do something compared to some of the other ways. So for this class, I'm just expecting you to collect your work. And it can be the start of a portfolio that you could potentially put online and use it to um, either, again, show employers or show potential clients. Employers or clients, you know, they're both employers, right? But typically when you think of employers, you think of someone that it goes and works in-house at a company, whereas you think of clients, you think of someone who's brought in like a consultant. Uh, for a company. And web developers, many web developers take either of those two routes. You know, they can either go and get clients and, and do projects and then move on to the next project, or they can go work internally uh, at a company. So, in a nutshell, what I want you to do is I want you to make a collection of your web pages. So you need a copy of all of your assignments, which you should have. You should definitely keep a copy of everything that you turn in, just on the odd case that something happens and uh, it doesn't make it to me correctly. All right. If you have not kept a copy of it, you can always download what you turned in originally. You can always go back to the Dropbox. All right. And you will sort of put a wrapper around it. In other words, you're not simply going to give me uh, folders on a disk that show all of your pages, uh, or that have all of your pages. You're, you're going to have a portfolio home page and so on for it. You're going to tie everything together, I guess is what I'm saying, into a coherent portfolio. And let me show you what I mean by that. Let me download a couple examples. So I'll download. This example, and another example. All right. And I'll pretend that these are different labs. So I'll call the one lab one and the other lab two. And I'll create a portfolio folder as well. So, your portfolio isn't simply turning in this folder that has all your lab folders in it. You need sort of something that brings it together. So, I'm going to create a portfolio homepage. So, I'll go open up Notepad.
then I might write a header, an article, or a section, a footer, and so on. So maybe I have a header that says Maybe I have a paragraph about myself. In a professional's portfolio, maybe it would say, you know, Mike Zellers is a Northern Ohio web developer who has X number of years experience in software development and Y number of years experience in um, web development. And maybe I'll highlight some of my more notable accomplishments or skill sets or whatever. So there'd be a paragraph about me. Again, you, that could be part of the header if you want to, or it could be a separate section. And then I'm going to have a section for my examples. I'm going to, for the sake of argument, um, make them an unordered list because that's really what these are. Or maybe I'll make an ordered list. I guess it depends on how you view your lab assignments. They weren't done in a certain order, so you could put them in an ordered list. I'm going to put these in an unordered list. And I'm going to make a link to them. Now, this is a little bit different because Notice that as I go to make the link to this, one of the things that we said all along is, well, we're going to assume everything's in the same folder. Well, we don't have things in our own folder. We have things in our own folders. We don't have everything in the same folder. Now. What I would suggest you do is keep them that way. Keep every assignment in its own folder. All right? And the reason for that is notice both in this assignment and in this other assignment, I have a page called FAQ. Well, I couldn't put two files named FAQ in the same folder. What could I do? I could rename one of them to something else. Well, that would be confusing if I had links between the two pages. Like here I have a link. You know, if I had a link from this page to the other page, um, that would be an issue. Many assignments call for pages having a link between each other. So maybe like I would have a link to that other page. And that would be, that would be a problem if I just go around renaming them. So I'm not going to bother renaming the files. I'm just going to create, uh, keep them all in their own folders. But then my web page, my home page for my portfolio is going to be in this folder. So I'm going to save it in that folder. And I'm going to call it index.html. So if I just put FAQ in here, it's not going to work. If I go and open this page, and I try to click on that, it's looking for it in the same folder. And it doesn't exist in that folder. It's actually in one folder down. And it's called lab1 faq.html. 
So the way I create a link to a folder down below the folder that the web page is in is I put the name of the folder and then a slash. So lab1 slash FAQ HTML will take me to the page called FAQ.HTML in the lab1 folder. So that folder is inside the it's, it's, that folder is inside the big folder, exactly. So now if I do that, I click on that, I go to that page. Now, I'm going to want a link going back to the main portfolio page. All right. So what I'm going to do is go into that folder, which I'm already there, edit this guy, and I'm just going to put probably right on the very top of the page, maybe in the header if you want, I'm going to say a href portfolio home. Now, on <laughs> home. Now, again, we have the same dilemma, right? Because I can't just put the name of index.html in there because I'm not in the folder where that page is. It's actually in the folder above. So to get to the folder above your current folder, you just need a dot dot. So, going down to the subfolder, you need to put the name of the folder. And if you think about it, that makes sense because every folder could have a bunch of subfolders underneath it. Our portfolio folder is going to have our lab 1, our lab 2, our lab 3, our lab 4, our lab 5 folder in it. All right? Every folder, however, only has one parent folder. So, we don't have to give the name of the parent folder. We just say dot dot slash. And that indicates to go up to the parent. So now if we do this, everything should work. We can go to lab one. We can go back to the portfolio home. So that's the big difference in this assignment. We're going to have things in their own folders. And believe me, this is the easiest way to do it as opposed to trying to get everything to fit in one folder and renaming some of your old stuff to a new name if you have duplicate names. So now when we come into the lab two one, we can go in, one second, we can go in and just say lab two. FAQ and then we can edit the page in the lab 2 folder to go up to the portfolio. You had a question? Um, uh, can you can, can, can Can you can put like a, like a lab two and three that we have them going back together? Mm -hmm. Can you do that in, in the portfolio two or just home page and uh, back to the whatever? Uh, I would. Every one of your labs sort of has a starting page, right? So like lab, I think lab three you added. You have two pages, and but those two pages link to each other. Yeah. Just send it. Just have a link to one of the pages for lab three. All right, and then you can go back and forth to them and then go back up to the portfolio. I don't want you to spend a lot of work changing your labs. Okay. All right, so send it to a page. You can have a links within that page and then have a link, have just the one page that you link to have it go back to the portfolio. So now we have this, 
we can go to the portfolio home, we can go back. I would like you to write some of your thoughts and observations about the lab that you worked on. Uh, I don't want it simply to be a list of links. So write a paragraph about yourself, create a footer that maybe has your email address in it, copy this footer into it and write something about each one say this lab I learned you have to put ending tags So I mentioned before, portfolios exist for different purposes. A portfolio for this class, I want you to include all your assignments. The good, the bad, and the ugly. All right? So, exactly. So, even if the lab isn't your best work, it should be included in your portfolio, but hopefully you've learned something from it. And if you did do a lab that you're especially proud of, Write why you're proud of it. Say, I really spent some extra time making the CSS for this lab look great. So don't just have links to your labs. Have some of your thoughts and observations about them. That's a little different, a portfolio that you might make for a class than a portfolio that you might make um, if you're looking for a job. If you're looking for a job, you're only going to include your very best work, right? But in this class, you're required to include all your work, all right? So that's essentially what you should do for your portfolio. Have a main folder, have an HTML page in it, along with any images that you might have, any CSS files that you might have, and then have subfolders for each of your lab assignments. Link to the lab assignment and have a link back to the portfolio. Any questions on that? The last, that, that's what you're going to turn in uh, October 3rd, which sounds like a long time from now, but actually isn't. It's like two weeks, maybe? Something like that. You also turn it in again at the end of the semester with the rest of the assignments, right? And in addition, between then, in the end of the semester, you're going to learn a lot more stuff like HTML with CSS, so you might improve the CSS of your portfolio page. Yes, you had a question. I was just going to ask, what's due this week? What's due this week? Uh, every, all the assignments that are due this week are due, are listed in Canvas. So there is a lab that's indicated. Okay, you're right. Everything's the same, just changes the backgrounds and stuff like that, colors. But yeah, due coming up, lab four is due Wednesday. You can read about that on Canvas. Uh, a lot of times people ask me uh, what you know, like what's due in this class. And I usually point them to Canvas, and I'm not doing that to be a jerk or to, you know, to, to say, hey, you know, uh, look it up yourself or whatever. It's honestly difficult for me to remember between all my classes what's due, what particular assignment that we're working on, what's due. Uh, I teach a number of classes for LC. I teach a couple in the University Partnership Program for University of Akron. So it's hard for me to keep straight, like, the day that an assignment is due or, uh, you know, exactly what's the assignment that's due this week or next week or whatever. So go to Canvas. It has a much better memory than I do. All right? So, yeah, I'm not, not trying to, like, just give you a hard time, but it's always best to look it up in Canvas. The portfolio, then, is, a, is due. Um, the first pass of the portfolio is due in October, and then the second pass is due in December.
October 3rd, November 28th. Your project, the first part of it is due October 31st, and the last part of it is due December 5th. So between now and Wednesday, if you don't have, if you haven't already, review the portfolio overview and the project overview, design instructions and rubric, rubric, rubric and the project completed instructions and rubric. All right. Now for the rest of today and probably into Wednesday and maybe into the following Monday, we're going to talk about your project, your semester project. Now the semester project is distinct from your homework assignments. All right. Uh, your homework assignments are pretty much done just one piece, one page or whatever. Whereas your project sort of brings together a bunch of pages into a unit that can be used to sort of communicate a message. What I'd like to do to start out with, though, is to talk about just the, the idea of web design, specifically the idea of good web design. What makes for a well-designed web page? What's a good web page? What are some of the characteristics of a well-designed web page? What are the characteristics of a poorly designed web page? Because we can go either way, right? We can look at the characteristics of a well-designed web page and say, hey, do that, all right? Or we can look at the characteristics of a poorly designed web page and say, hey, don't do that, all right? So before we start, does anyone have examples of a well or poorly designed web page? Because I think that is your assignment for next week. There are. There are a lot of them. Can you think of one? Interpunk. Okay, Skateland and Lorraine. Uh, let's well, let's look that with this one up. Skateland and Lorraine. Skate World. Uh, maybe that's. And a disclaimer. Is this the one? Okay. That's the only one I'm aware of in Lorraine is Skate World. And I mean, it was there when I was in high school, amazingly enough. Because it really would have hurt me to bring up their web page. Because I, I have fond memories of Skate World in Lorraine. China. Interpunk. 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 Yeah, interpunk.com. That's a really bad website. <laughs> they sell good stuff, but it's very bad. <laughs> okay, I like this one. <laughs> All right, this is, a good, this is a good place to start. Why don't you like it? Or, or, and, and just anyone. What, what, what's wrong with this? Too much. Too much. All right. It's overcrowded. People just going there is going to be so lost. Okay. Let's see time getting stuff done. Okay, so there's some good characteristics of a web page, or good, good examples of bad characteristics. Of a web page. It's tough when I'm talking like in double negatives here. So I'm going to put a void on this page and do on this page. So avoid overcrowded and too much content.
Some web developers seem to have the idea that if five things on a page is good, then 55 would be really great. Okay? What's wrong with that thought process, that more is always better? It's a lie, okay. Why is it a lie? Make things cluttered. And it makes it harder to navigate, right. Keep in mind, the more that you put on the page, the more that you have competing for your user's attention. All right, the more things are competing for the user's attention. Which means your user is likely to miss the important stuff. All right, it's liable to miss the important stuff. So therefore, by having too much, it provides a distraction. There's nothing to focus on for the user. Can anyone think of an, ex uh, an example of a, a home page that does this differently, that, that maybe has not much content on their page? I can think of one for sure. Let's go to Apple's website. Kind of hard to get distracted when there's only one thing on the page, essentially. There are other things, I know. But there's one main thing that's being focused on the page. Well, okay, three main things that are focused on the page. But yeah, but there's only one point. There's only one point, exactly. They want to sell that three things more than anything else. Exactly. You, as a user, are focused in on the things that they want to emphasize. All right. The negative part of this, if you went to Apple because you want to find out about something very specific, this could be a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. Find That's why they got the search bar over there at the top. Well, well, let's let, let's hold that through. That's true. That's true. It, uh, I, I'm not going to say that that's not true, but the idea would be is that you would somehow compensate for that some other way, and that's where the navigation on the top or the search bar would come in. So uh, that's definitely a good point, all right? That if you limit the contents of the page, if you're not interested in that content, well, you might have to click a link or whatever. But it's, it's a case of balancing. Personally, I'd rather take my chances then I'm going to be able to figure out this, then figuring out this. All right? So, point well taken as far as, as far as that goes. That's sort of the downside of having too sparse of a web page. Another example of a web page that doesn't throw a lot at you at once is Google. All right? There's your search button, or search box, Gmail, other choices, all right? And again, you might have come to Google for something other than to do a search, right? But, you know, probably most people going to Google are doing searches. But if you're coming for something else, you can always get to it there. Google News, Google Play, YouTube, Google Drive, and so on. That really is the art of, of design, right? Is to take something that's complicated and make it simple. All right? The Interpunk site sort of took something that's complicated and made it complicated, right? <laughs> there, was no, there was no apparent thought put in on organizing and dividing the information in a way that would be easily digestible. At least with these two other sites, although you can make some complaints to say, well, if you're looking for this, it might be a little more difficult. At least there was some thought and some care put into the process that you go to through finding it. Can anyone think of a web page that they either don't, strongly don't like or strongly like? Yes. Dropbox? You mean the actual site Dropbox? Yeah. Okay. Right. 
what do you like or don't like about this? It's very minimalistic and straight to the point. Like they're trying to sell a product and they can scroll down if they list what the different tiers provide, then they get to the thing you can buy it. Okay. All right, so um, focused on a purpose, I'm going to put down. Appropriate amount of content. Can anyone else think of a website that they either like or don't like? I have a fondness for one called lunarcow.com. Lunarcow.com. Might be more friendly than normal ones, but I'm curious Here's an example of our portfolio. What do we like or don't like about this? What do you like about it, David? Um, believe it or not, I actually do enjoy some of the uh, texture, the, the vibrant colors. Uh, the searchability issue, I find it easy to navigate, but it is probably on the design end of it, uh, more flamboyant. Okay. Um, you, in this case, you like. A, for last of, for, for last of a better word, a flashy appearance, colors, etc. Okay? Anyone else have a comment on this? little whimsical thing, a cow that walks across the screen that when you mouse over it you get to see an x-ray of it. Bunch of links up here, navigation. So this is a lot less minimal than some of the other sites. What is the advantage of having, or let me, let, me, let me phrase it this way. Let's think for a second that maybe sometimes it's good to be minimal and sometimes it's good to be flashier. Let's try not to be narrow-minded and say it's always good to be one or the other. Under what situations might you want to be minimal? Under what situations might you want to have a more flashy sort of appearance. I would think in this case you're dealing with one topic. So um, it's not like uh, Google or Apple where you've got a multitude of options. If you put all the options on one page, it would be kind of overwhelming. Here you're talking about interactive mouse. OK. In the primary focus. OK, what is, what is this organization, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, is, is part of the question. What, what do you think they do? You've landed on this website. They do have interactive maps. But you're right. It's, 
they do do more because they are on the other one and have work development. Right. Right. think marketing experts, a marketing firm, and they want to showcase what some of the things that they can do. So, if LeBron James is showcasing some of the things that he can do, are they going to include footage of him making a free throw, footage of him making a layup? Or are they going to put in footage of him making an amazing dunk over three opponents? All right? Uh, maybe a bad analogy. I don't know. Given that this company wants your business and wants to show you what they can do marketing-wise, it makes sense that their website might be a little flashier because they're showing you the kinds of things that they can do. They're showcasing their skills. All right. So therefore, since they're showcasing their skills, they're showcasing their web development skills, they might want to try a variety of web development techniques to show you the things that they can do. Apple is not after your web development dollar, right? They're not they don't want to develop Apple does not want to develop your website for you. Neither does Google. So, they have no reason of making their website look flashy. Right? However, this organization could be do doing all sorts of different development jobs, so they want to show that they have the technical skills to do any number of different development projects. All right? So that might be one reason why this is a little flashier than a website, say, for Apple or for Google. They have, different, they have a different purpose in mind. All right. One thing I liked about the comment for Dropbox a while ago is the statement was focus on purpose. Well, different organizations are going to have different purposes. All right. So when you talk about having to find a focus on a purpose, what your purpose is is going to have a big impact on the way your site stuff is designed. So, I would add to this list, not only are they focused on purpose, but the design of the site resonates with the purpose. For example, let's look at the Wall Street Journal's website. Close your eyes and imagine in your head what you think the Wall Street Journal's website is. Wall Street Journal is a very serious newspaper about financial stuff. It's been around for a long, long, long time. Looks like a newspaper, right? Not a lot of colors. Little bit of color, just to bring attention to things. Basically, it looks like a newspaper. Black and white, with some pictures. Let's look at Cedar Point's website. Definitely a flashier appearance, right? This doesn't look like a newspaper. This has colors, this has animations, and so on. Would you say one of these, these take very different design approaches, 
right? The Wall Street Journal and the Cedar Point site don't look anything like each other, all right? But it's possible that they both could be well designed. How could that be? How could you have two sites that look nothing like each other, yet both of them are well designed? Different purposes, different audience. Different purpose, different audience? Exactly. It's kind of like saying, well, swim trunks and a snowsuit are designed totally differently. How can they be both well designed? Well, because they're each designed for their own purpose. All right? So the purpose of the site has a lot to do with how you're going to design it. And the design of the site should resonate the purpose of the site, or the mood, or the feel of the site. If Cedar Point's website looked like the Wall Street Journal's website, Cedar Point's website looked like this, that'd be boring if it looked like that. If the Wall Street Journal's website looked like Cedar Point's website, it would be hard to take seriously. So a key thing in the design of a website is that the theme of the website, or the purpose of the website, and the design go hand in hand. A website that's meant to be for entertainment ought to sort of look entertaining. It shouldn't look like you're reading a, a, a legal textbook, all right? On the other hand, a website that has a legal textbook on it shouldn't look like you're reading a comic book, all right? So those two things go hand in hand. So getting back to the Lunar Cows website, the idea here is they're marketing professionals that want your business developing your website. And they want to show that they have the technical skills to do that. So what better way to show the technical skills than to showcase on their own website the fact that they have these technical skills to do these things. And even if it's a little bit of overkill, that matches sort of the purpose of the site to showcase their skills. So maybe it can be well designed, even though it's much flashier than the other sites that we looked at. My one issue I would say about this site is it could have just been bad timing, but the first time we loaded this page, it took forever for me, uh, if you remember. I'd go back and watch the video. It took, I don't know how long, but 30 seconds maybe. Um, every subsequent time it goes a lot quicker because the pages are probably cached and therefore it doesn't have to reload everything from the server, but it did seem, the initial load seems to be, um, uh, take a while. We'll continue this topic next time. What, want, what we want to do, and, and think about this between now and then, is we want to sort of list some characteristics of a well-designed website. Then we're going to talk about a process of how we can get to that point for the websites that we develop. All right? Because if we have in mind goals for our web design of what we want, what constitutes a good web design, then we need to look at a process to go through for us to get to those goals so that we're not just hitting and missing and trying random things till we get something that sticks. So that will be our task next week. Oh, no, sorry, not next week. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. It will be our task Wednesday when we uh, define some characteristics for good web design. Then we'll look at, well, how can we, how can we get to that point in our own projects? Question? All right, we'll see you up in the lab.